obviously you know where to find us. <laughs> but in the event that our new listeners are checking in and clocking in, we uh, encourage you to follow us. Uh, we're on at Pod the Score, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, and any your favorite uh, podcast listening software, device, app, you can find our podcast on there. Uh, so who are we? You can meet the host. A little bit about myself on top of my educational background. I'm currently serving as the Assistant Director of Bands at Prairie View A&M University, an HBCU just outside of Houston, Texas. Over 12 years experience in the public school setting. Uh, I was actually not only a band director, but one year stint as an assistant principal. I'm a proud son of immigrants. I'm a husband and father of two. I had to make sure I say that. And uh, I'm actually a former DJ. I started DJing at the age of 14, um, and I kept it going all the way until I was a high school band director, or I did not have the time, which will be a topic of discussion today. And then uh, most recently, I was named one of the Yamaha Top 40 Under 40 uh, in 2021. My name is uh, Justin McLean. I'm the second part of this this duo and this this team collective that you know is the score. And I am currently in my 11th year. Uh, I am at High Tower High School in Missouri City, Texas, and Lake Olympia Middle School as the percussion director and associate director of bands at both campuses. Um, I working on a Masters of Divinity, very heavily involved in ministry and church and things of that nature. So I'm working through that. I am a husband. And I'm a father, unlike my brother here. I have quite a bit. I have four. Uh, so keep me in your prayers. Uh, <laughs> I'll be rushing out of here as soon as we're done. Um, and, and as well as the other things that have invested into my teaching career. I'm an artist. I've put out a product, a music uh, producer, and doing ministry stuff at my church. So, yeah. So how did we meet? Uh, <laughs> well, he and I were actually in the Prairie View Marching Storm. You're, you're, you're older than him, so I went in in 2005, you went in 2006, and we got to work together at Hamilton Middle School before we took on the assignment at Heights High School in the inner city of Houston, um, and we were working together to rebuild a band program there. Uh, and so this was one of our final times being together, and we got the, uh, if you've seen, if you got some Texas folks, you've seen this triangle trophy before that people uh, strive to get. And so a little bit about that, that school that we were at, 6A Varsity, 6A is the classification that we put schools in Texas in regards to school enrollment. 6A is the largest, and, uh, but our school is 70% economically disadvantaged, 80% Latino, 12% African American, and 7% white. I walked into the program with this many students. Uh, they had just gotten a four, four, five at concert sight reading. Uh, kids couldn't stand each other. <laughs> um, pretty much asked us, how are you going to repair our relationships? It wasn't even about the music. It was like, I don't like him, and I don't like her, and we don't get along. And so I was thinking to myself, like, it's not even about music. But we were fortunate enough to, to work together and create a product that we're proud of. And since then, a lot of our students, we got the program to 165 students in three years. Uh, so we started with 55, got it to 165. And that trophy you saw, we took the band program to the first time er ever uh, to aerial marching contest through the UIL system. Um, our region was, was really competitive. It was with KDISD, which pretty much all their schools get straight ones. Several of them go to marching contests, etc. And that's the region we were a part of. Um, so we were um, at this school, just to paint a picture even more, we had a zero dollar budget. Zero dollar budget. It was all at will, uh, at request, uh, and the principal had the ultimate decision to say yes or no. So we did a lot, a lot of fundraising. I, I woke up on my office room floor after a football game because my frat brother was cooking chicken outside and an employee had to be on campus to arm, uh, disarm the code. The next morning was my birthday. I mean, that's the death. And then we got up, sold chicken, and then went to a marching contest. That's the level of dedication we had to put into this program. And this was one of the last things we did. And like I said, several of our students have gone on to either pursue music or in collegiate marching bands uh, and programs. Now with all that background, uh, we, we really want to get to the heart of why we do what we do and why the score even became a thing. And it's our goal. Our goal is to provide tangible concepts and ideas and information that I think are more pivotal in today's world and going into the classroom. When we worked together those years, we spent so much time, you know, as we know, talking shop. And we got to a point where we said, there's some information here that the majority of us as music educators, whether you're in elementary music, middle school band, high school band, collegiate band, that this information is vital. It's not to knock the textbook. It's not to knock what we've all learned at our respective colleges. But we wanted to give something that you can plug in right away and start to see some difference. And it's going to make you a little bit uncomfortable. It's going to make you have to work to learn some of these things and be vulnerable for these things. But we want to provide tangible information and ideas and get outside of the box of what we've always done to really help us get to where we need to 
you know, to make the student successful. So one of those first things that we talked about, which is kind of synonymous with our relationship and our friendship and brotherhood, is this idea of unity and camaraderie. And I want to really talk about what I noticed here when we got here yesterday. Um, we go to TMEA every year. We, we, there's a whole thing with that. But when we got here, I just observed, I, I met Brett getting here, and I observed this, this living out of unity amongst all of you here um, as directors. Whether you, I mean, I met Dr. Talley, uh, Mr. Jones, these are collegiate directors. And for me, it was an out-of-body experience because at TMEA, you don't talk to those directors on a face-to-face -face level, right? If you see the director of bands from UT or whoever that's on program, it's like you've seen a movie star. And so not only did I see that, but through the mixer and just hanging out and talking shop, I saw a real live unity session of directors that weren't concerned about scores or how many kids in the program or who's on your private lesson staff or whatever, y'all were talking as though y'all grew up together. And I think that that made me see the difference in what it is at TMEA and why there's a divide and why that even goes into our band halls, into those communities. It's because we lack the idea that, yes, we may look different. Yes, we come from different backgrounds, but there's a, a unifying factor here. It's the idea of music and inspiration that we give to these kids, to these students. And it was just amazing to see. I was flabbergasted. I, I mean, I kept talking to Eric, I was talking to Brett, and Brett was looking at me like, yo, this is just what we do, man. <laughs> and and, and it's, it's, it's refreshing because we sell this idea in our band halls. We want our kids to know, hey, you may be from the suburbs, hey, you may be from an urban area, hey, you play clarinet, you play alto sax, but together there's a level of harmonious music that we make. And for our programs going forward, especially post the pandemic, at the end of the day, if we're not going to be unified, not only did that pandemic give us this isolating feeling, if we come back together and we don't think, okay, how can I be connected with you? Not off of, oh, you made one so we can have a conversation. Oh, you have region band students. We can talk. Oh, you were on the honor band list. We can talk. No, how can I be of assistance to you? Hey, I had a kid forget their mouthpiece just like last week. And yes, I have a region banner. Yet all of these nuances, and I saw that last night, and it was amazing to see all of these different directors. We come from different colleges. We like different styles of music, but we're gonna talk shop. And I, and that, and then that talking shop is not to push myself, it's not to push ego. It's for me to say, hey, we all got issues, man. We all working through this the same way. And I think for me and Eric, what has helped us in our career is that we are not willing to sacrifice this idea of unity in our classroom. That in, no matter what, I want to make sure that you know that I'm on the same page as you, even though we've come from various backgrounds. I have to echo Justin on that. I've been going to TMEA now 12 years consistently, and I've dealt with some identity issues myself because of being a Latino band director. Everybody just, I'm, I'm thinking, they assume I teach mariachi. This is what I do, you know? Right. Uh, so to see that last night, I want to hopefully try to bring some of that back to the oh, table in our sure, state sure. Um, and, and remove some of that ego to better serve our kids. So, anybody in the crowd recognize this picture? It was all on social media last week. I'll give you an insight. This was one of the most it's at TMEA, one of the most attended sessions at the Texas Music Educators Association convention. Any idea what the topic of discussion was? Any guesses? We can entertain some guesses. Woodwind tips. Woodwind tips. <laughs> it was actually how to avoid teacher burnout. If this is not an indicator of the current state of music education, I'm not sure what is. And you know, we were joking last night because we were like, you know, how many are on your staff? And they're like, my staff. And everybody's like, everybody just pointed at themselves, you know? And I was like, well, us Texas folks gotta keep our minds shut over here, you know? <laughs> because we've gotten used to this system that's been put in place that benefits us. That honestly, I don't know if I would have been able to do it if I was a single band director. And so I'm asking myself, where do we go from here? So most recently, I just got the job at Prairie View full time in January. Prior to that, I was back into the high school band hall uh, from August all the way to December. Took over an inner city program in Acres Homes, Texas, north side of Houston. If you're familiar with the artist Slim Thug, he went to high school there. Uh, inner city, uh, urban, lower income. And I walked in and I said, all right, where's my roster? And they're like, what roster? I said, don't you have a roster of students that were in the band? <laughs> and they're like, what's on charms? Who's, who's still active. Nobody could answer me. And I was like, okay, here we go. So I was 
in social media. I was getting the students. First day of band camp, I had 32 students. And then on top of that, I'm very punctual, by the way, as I think we all are. I'm sitting down already at 7.58 to start right on the downbeat of 8 o'clock to do some type of icebreaker with them and to talk to them. And to, I, did, I remember I did a change one. And all I could think about was like, okay, here we go again. All I did at Heights again, I'm going to do this at this school. And it was my intent of serving those kids. But I also recognized I had been not teaching music the way I have been in two years. That changed my life. It made me question my career choices. When I, and I really reflected on that. When you've been playing or teaching music since sixth grade and you get the rug pulled from under you, you start thinking, is this even worth it? Should I consider something else? I have a different avenue. I could go to construction management. Uh, I actually got my insurance licenses and did that off to the side and make some extra bread. And I mean, it was just really one of those things. So when I walked in, I kept that in mind. It was a lot of trauma, a lot of death, a lot of mental health issues. And so I took an approach that says, we got to teach these kids to love this art again. And I had to teach myself to keep that enthusiasm. That the best advice that I got from a mentor of mine, I said, I'm taking over a program, what's the first thing I do? And I'm thinking, I need to get to UIL, I need to do X, Y, and Z, I need to get to area marching contest. And his response was, just make band fun. And I was like, okay, what's next? No, he's like, that's it. <laughs> make band fun. You gotta want them to be there. And it really changed my perspective. So in, in Texas, we have the eight hour rule, you can only practice up to eight hours. I never did that the entire marching season. I gave them Monday off every day because what did I hear? I still have to work, Mr. Jimenez. I still have, to, I picked up a job because my pops isn't working. I need help at home. Is there any, I can't be in band. Nope, let's create a solution. I'm gonna give you Monday off. Can we work that out? Can we do two days a week? I always work with them. Yes, sir, I can do that. Can I leave early from the game? I gotta go work at Waterburger right, so right at 11. Yes, sir, we think we can make that happen. Just all those things. And the students were flabbergasted. They're like, you say yes to everything. And I was like, no, nah, not everything. I was like, we're not playing Ladder of a Thousand or the horse. No, that's we're not, we're, we're not doing that. All right? You know, and they would joke about that. And But I would say, but you entertain, you listen to us. And I said, isn't this the point? Like, this is y'all's band. I'm not the one in front of that. And I said, I just make y'all do it. And they were really taken aback to that. So what ended up happening is they felt included in the decision making. I like his term. They were co-laborers with me. We sat down and went through the whole library and said, what stand tunes do y'all like? Yeah, we don't like that one. Cool. What about that one? Not that one. All right, we got a custom arranger. What's, what's some tunes y'all want? Well, we want X, Y, and Z. Cool. So then we still went course style on the field, but we turned up in the stands and did a little bit more of an HBC influence. And it was funny because I was labeled the show band guy. And I was the first HBC alumnus to take over a, a hit high school bus spot in that district. And everybody in the, in the district, you know how we talk. Oh, you're going to come in here. You don't know what to do. You're going to kill that program. Them show band guys, da 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 da. And so he got back to me, like, you're not upset? So no. I said, because never once did anybody tell me you're the show band guy. My principal just asked for more recognizable music in the stands. And I delivered. And they're like, really? Nobody told you that? I said, yeah. So there's a misconception. There's a stigma. Right. Hence why we celebrated what we saw last night. Folks from different walks of life coming together and breaking bread and enjoying a good time. Yeah. So I'm asking ourselves now. My, my pops gave me this because I I think we're all guilty of this, but I know I, I'm really bad at this. When I go so hard to the work, I neglect myself. I'm quick to leave a football game and slide through Whataburger and fall asleep right after I finish that double meet. <laughs> and I wake up feeling like not too good the next day, knowing that was a bad decision. December, my blood pressure was at the highest it's ever been. My cholesterol was through the roof. Because in my mind, 60 to 70 hours was less than what I'm usually doing, but it was still too much. I was doing consistent 13 hour days, 19 hour gang days, and then we had a marching contest on Saturday. So it got to close to 70 sometimes, but average 60. To the point where my son asked, where's daddy? And he's three. And that one hurt, I was like, mm, I don't wanna do that. So it started making me think about the state of education and specifically music education. What can we do to create a plan of longevity? We've seen the exodus of our colleagues go into real estate, go into entrepreneurship, and they're really good at what they do. But when you really dig deep and ask them what happened, mm, I was done. Man, but you reached X, Y, and Z. I was done. I didn't want to do it anymore. So that. That session, I didn't get to attend it at TMEA because I had, a, I had the same session at the same time, which made me realize if that's not a cry for help, I don't know what is. 
And that's where we have to redirect and shift our thought process and the approach that we have. Whether it's, are we reaching programmatic goals or student goals? Are we focusing on developing the individual or to get that trophy up on the, to, to build my resume? To go in line to what Justin's talking about. So I can call that clinician, now they'll come and work with me. And that's where I'm, I'm pleading with my, my colleagues to stop doing that, to say no. One of the things that I took away because I got the handout from that session, that no is a complete sentence. We're so used to saying, no, I can't because I have rehearsal X, Y, and Z. Just say no. And if the principal comes back at you and says, hey, you, no, are you going to do this? No, let's talk. Let's, here's why I can't do this. And now, if I had no with ample time, I could put it in the calendar. We could prepare for it. But telling me on a Tuesday that I got to perform on a Friday is not going to work for me nor my kids. I have to give them ample time. Then when you set those barriers and those standards, guess what? They know. Hey, you got to let the director know and with ahead of time. And that's something that I had to even implement at my last school. They would hit me up on a Tuesday, Pip rally on Friday. I'm, Excuse me? I said, I got a clinician coming in. I already had scheduled him come over my percussion. And they're like, well, this is what we have to do. Okay, well, we're going to be there because I'm paying him. And they had to send an email and they're like, you're not going to, the head coach comes out. Man, the band ain't going to be there. Nope, not going to be there. And we had this on the calendar. We did not. You know what I'm saying? But I had enough backbone to be able to have that conversation where I know some of my colleagues would be like, we'll be there. We'll figure it out a way. And now you're running ragged, trying to fill out the field trip form to get the kids out of class to go do a last minute performance. And then nobody shows up to the pep rally. <laughs> so I ask now, specifically speaking about how we move this forward, because I myself, this is Eric as a head drum major in my high school band program. You see my custom piece and chain. I have my, my edge up. I had in the, in the, this picture, I had the gray Jordan fours with some oversized shorts and a two X t-shirt. You couldn't tell me nothing, but I had straight A's. I was president of organizations. I oversaw all the high school councils of LULAC, which is the largest and oldest civil rights organization for Latinos in the city of Houston. But that day, this day right here, I walked in and dropped off my saxophone. We had a shared music hall with the orchestra director. I said, get out of here. And I knew how to code such really, really well by then. I said, excuse me, sir. He said, get out of here. I said, I, I'm just dropping off my instrument. No, you're not. Get out of here. People like you couldn't be in band. I said, sir, you're going to watch me. I will have the combination. I'm going to put it up. And he was yelling at me while I'm unlocking it. Slid it in. And I, in my mind, I wanted the north side of Houston, Texas to come out of me. <laughs> and, I, and I wanted to say certain things, but I also knew, man, he's going to lie on me. He's going to tell the principal on me. So I got to keep it cool. And I, said, I said, sir, I'm walking out. This was before school. We always had the opportunity to do that. And for whatever reason, he was there that day. So I went to my band director and said, hey, I was going to let you know, so-and-so yelled at me today. Tell me I wasn't, a person like me can't be in band. He said, what? I said, yeah, man, that's what he said. And they already didn't like each other. I said, can I ask you for a favor? He said, what's up? Can I conduct today? He said, sure, we're running a couple pep tunes. It's no big deal. And that's why you see me conducting here. What that, that picture doesn't show is that that orchestra director walked out of his office and dropped his job. Then later on in my life, my program, I oversaw this Another program, Davis High School, built it up to about 120 students, added orchestra, added mariachi. We were award-winning, 97% lower income school. That judge at UIL was the guy that kicked me out, and my orchestra made straight ones. And I like to think about it. I wanted to go say, shake his hand and be like, I know you don't remember me, but uh, you made a huge impact in my life. <laughs> but then it made me start thinking about the approach that I take in the classroom. I took this from Stephen Covey. If you've never read The Highly Effective Habits, I encourage you to do so. One is that I look at students as an emotional bank. Now I've worked in predominantly lower income settings where I look at them and I hope, I wish, I could pull out my wallet and say, go eat. And you've been wearing that same shirt, go buy something. But we know that's not feasible. Don't get me wrong, I found ways still to be creative, but I couldn't do that for every one of my students. So I took this approach that I learned that every student that walked in, I had an opportunity to make a deposit into their lives. But it was more so of an emotional deposit. And it's as simple as, Man, I see them new sneakers. I see you, boy. You know? And then, you know what I'm saying? I just get a little something, something, three minutes, you know? Or on the way out to my car, stop by the volleyball game. Pop your head in and make sure your band student sees you. So that next day you can say, hey, good job yesterday. Another deposit. For me, teaching in the predominant Latino community, we both 
got quinceanera invitations every single year. Then my colleagues would ask me, like, what is this? Is it like a wedding invitation? Like what? I said, you go. And you, and you go with an appetite. You know? And, and so that in itself allowed us to keep making these deposits, 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 to let the kid know they care. And it's not about the music. They literally care about me. They want to know about my family, my siblings. If I'm acting up in another class, they, they're going to check me. But we all know we have to redirect our students sometime or another. That's when you take the withdrawal. The unfortunate part that a lot of our colleagues do is they take a withdrawal before they've made enough deposits and they overdraft. Kid quits music. Kid cusses you out. Kid just stops showing up. This in itself has been my secret and my top teaching strategy. Before I can go in on an ensemble, do I even know you? Do I know your name? That has helped me just project even walking into Prairie View and kicking off a brand new jazz ensemble that I stopped and I said, all right, it's gonna be corny, but tell me your full name and your, and your favorite cereal. And they looked at me like, Wait, what you doing, Prairie? I said, man, just tell me, just, hey man, indulge me. And they went around the room, I don't really have a favorite cereal. Then pick one if I forced you to do one. You know, uh, Cinnamon Toast Crunch. By the end of everybody around, you could feel the tension just went away in the room. And I says, y'all notice something? We vibing now. Now we can make some music. I said, y'all seen some really good ensembles. There's this no communication, verbal sometimes. And you can see the rhythm section just look at each other like, mm -hmm. we locked in. That in itself has allowed me to just say, now let's work on the music. But this is so key for what our students are experiencing. I have students that told me I have social anxiety, Mr. Jimenez. I am overwhelmed. I, I want to cry. I've been at home by myself for two years now, and I'm a senior, and I don't want to be here. I had to take that into account and say, hey, man, go sit in the practice room. When you're ready, come on. Took him about two, three weeks, got his sax. I walked him to his car, and he's like, I have my sax, but it's in my car. Cool, let's go get it. Let's walk. Open the trunk. Come on, man. Cool, let's go. When you're ready, pull it out. You want to go to the practice room? Contributing member at this point out. Even to the point where he's like snarky. <laughs> I was like, okay, man, you got a little attitude to yourself now. That that helps. So I think in order to get to that beauty of what Eric is talking about, there has to be some reconstructing, some deprogramming of the biases that we just all naturally carry from how we've been reared, what we've been exposed to. And for me, it, it starts like this. I, I remember in high school, my mother was very adamant about like, you need to take another language. You, you, you need to take me another year of Spanish. And I'm just like, mom, what, what are we doing? Like, I'm, I'm a senior, I just, come on, like, what, what are we doing right now? She said, no, you, you need to do this. And my mother being an educator and principal, she understood where we were going, right? And so I took it begrudgingly, went to college, had to fulfill those requirements. I did not put forth the effort that I should have. We all know, there was those classes. Was just, hey, pass me, I'm trying to get a body, right? <laughs> and so, I didn't know that I would be uh, in a predominantly Latino community when I started teaching. I didn't. I had no clue. I was just like, I want to teach the kids that need a person like me in the classroom. Hence, we we meet up again in, in, in the professional world. So I walk into this this band with all these kids, um, and I had to deprogram. I had to reconstruct what I thought. Not that it was even anything negative, but it was just ignorant. I didn't know. I, I had been exposed to a Latino community that I grew up in. But as we all know, we can't broad stroke people. We can't broad stroke a race or a culture. We have to be in, intentional about knowing that. So whether that was the racial aspect, understanding, and I remember just like it was yesterday, that the different aspects of where a student is from in Mexico means something, like a major thing. Like I, I'm, I'm talking about this student is from, you know, this part of Mexico. And, and if I say, oh, you from here? No, 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 I'm not from there, Mr. Queen. Like, don't, don't, don't. And so we got these turf wars going on of like, you know, all of those types of things. Um, and so it took me taking my taking a step back and seeing that for what it was and not looking at that as something that's like, oh, that, that doesn't matter. No, the level of the deposits that you make shows through the care of getting to understand the specifics of what those things are. Because this 12 year old, doesn't care that you're trying to get them to understand breathing and phrasing. If I don't even take the courage and the, the uncomfortable, vulnerable place to be like, oh, okay, so y'all, what, what part of Mexico did y'all drive to this weekend? Okay, cool. So what food is there? Like, I don't want to, and their eyes are lighting up because it takes me to be vulnerable for them to be vulnerable enough for me to say, okay, I need you to sit up straight. 
I really need you to breathe deeply. And all of these things that kids are not thinking about doing without another kid looking at them. I had to reconstruct that. I had to also look at the financial aspect of whatever was happening in my band hall, not to associate based off of what I saw, but really get into the nuts and bolts of it and say, hey, um, how can I be of assistance? I know you haven't paid your instrument rental fee. Say no, say no more. We'll figure out a plan and do what needs to be done. Instead of using, I came from, I call it the big city. Eric has tried to help me and understand. I, I grew up in a more rural very, country town. Very, very rural. <laughs> it's expanding now. But but in, in my community, everybody had an instrument at the house. Because somebody's older brother or sister played clarinet. The, the instrument uh, band fee or, or going in to pick your instrument, it was based on what did your cousin play? And you don't play trumpet. <laughs> and I just lucked out because I just told my mom, I was like, I'm going in for drums. If they don't give me that, I'm coming out. <laughs> so so I went in. And, and so for me, I'm going into an urban environment in the inner city. I'm like, oh, everybody should have at least a clarinet, sax or something. And that wasn't the norm. And so then I had to take a step back and say, okay, am I going to learn that? And then is that going to impact how I provide? Hey, here's our instrument rental fee. Here's how we work this. Everybody needs this. We have these base packages. If you don't need, if you don't, you can't get this, don't worry. We'll talk. I'll put you on a list. We'll make sure you get what you need. Right. And then we further, this is the thing that really helped. And this is what drew me in was the cultural and the music. Right. So, so, so I would be talking to, to my class and we'd be talking about, you know, all of these different things about real life things and family. And so I was talking to a student one day and, and you know, I was like, now, you know, your mama don't play, you know, so you need to make sure after rehearsal you go. And she was like, how, how do you know that? Like, I was like, you may be Latino and I'm black, but when your mama throw a shoe across the room, my mama gonna throw that same shoe. It just, <laughs> it just looks different. And she breaks down laughing, you know, and, and so right there in that moment. And I remember I made this, this, uh, I made this statement in front of the band and I said, all of us are much more closer than what we Right? The, the same meal that you get excited about in your family, we get excited about that too. It looks different. And it goes back to that unity point. That unity is not that we all have all things in common. No, unity is that there's so much of a difference that we can talk about those differences and see the nuances. But if I went into that and just said, oh, well, you know, all the Latino community, you guys do. <laughs> no, we don't all do anything. Just like the African-American community doesn't all do one thing. Right. And so then going even into the music and, and seeing the nuances there, like I asked the kids, hey, take me, like, give me the top bonded artists. And they were like, oh, you need to listen to this person. Oh, you need to listen to this person. You need to. But if I'm only going in with Selena, then there's a problem. Right. Because, with, oh, Selena, you know, I know you, you love a good bitty bitty bum bum. And it's like, <laughs> Mr. McLean, uh, I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> right. right. So it's, the, it's those things. But that's, that's making me vulnerable. And as band directors, we never want to be vulnerable. We want to know the score. We want to know where all the accidents, like, you know everybody's part backwards and forwards because you don't want the student to be like, wait a minute, Ms. Mr. McLean, you said at measure eight, there's this, that rhythm you said was wrong, right? And we don't ever want that to happen on the bandstand, but we have to be in a position. That's why I said we got to rework some things that have locked us into a life and into a role that has probably hindered more kids than helped. And it hasn't been from a place of negativity, but just because we don't know. So when they've given me that bonded list, then I'm, I'm like, oh man, you should check out this artist. And they're like, you listen to that? I was like, oh, so you thought that I, and they're like, no, I'm not. So I was like, oh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a, so it, it opens this conversation where the kids become very locked in to what you're doing in that classroom. Cause it's not just a, a list of here's what we're going to do. And this is how it's going to be happening. And be honest with yourself. Like, be—I I had to be honest and say, I don't—I don't know what I think I know. And Eric had to pull me to the side, and he was like, "It's okay, man. Like, it's like at the same time that he was educating me, I'm educating him, and it's a—it's a relationship and this rapport back and forth. Like, oh, I never knew that. I never knew that either. So that honesty also helps us admit mistakes when we make them. One of the things that um, we have to get out of is—it's like as a father of four. One of the things me and my wife we try to do is. I want to apologize if I did something wrong to my child or if I yelled or if, or maybe I was too harsh of a punishment. I want to pull them out and say, hey, son, I'm sorry. I was I was a little frustrated earlier. I apologize for that, right? Now, if I'm willing to do that in my home and we say that our band halls are, are places or an oasis for our kids, then I need to do the same. 
hey, I was teaching really fast and I misrepresented this rhythm right here. This is how this goes. Hey, uh, I told you you needed to turn this paperwork in here. You turned it in there and I, I misplaced it. I refilled it out. That's on me. And when kids see that, when they understand that you're a human being, because my band director wasn't going to do that. And not that he was purposely trying to be perfect. He just, Mr. Taylor, he was law. And so I didn't even think to be like, he said something wrong right there, but he's kind of crazy, so I'm going to just chill. Right? And so here I am getting the same opportunity where I want to make the kids know that, hey, this is a place of safety. And that safety comes from me breaking down and tearing apart things that were tethered for, we thought that were good, it was good, but it actually was, was something that was bad. So I think we have to reprogram that. And there, there, there are specifics that where that is for you. You may not, you may be fine in the racial, you may be fine in the financial and understanding those, those dynamics, but there's something that you do have to deconstruct to be better fit for the kids. By the way, admitting when you made a mistake is a great rehearsal technique. I've implemented with all my ensembles. Uh, if you're on the field, uh, we had check and set. They stand at check, you know, feet are in their whatever tension position they're in. And it helps me, obviously, with visuals, and they're not having to move around. And I say, admit if you made a mistake. Everybody raise your hand. And I say, let me see the sweat stains. Raise it up. Okay? <laughs> all right. Point at your mistake. Okay? I want you to figure out why you made that mistake. This next rep, don't make it. Set, click, click, click. And then we start working. Take it into the jazz ensemble. Point at your mistake. Why did you make the mistake? What is the reason? Is it rhythm? Can I help you with it? Whatever. And just that willingness of myself and modeling that when I do make a mistake. All right, start at measure 72. What does your minute do? 52. I mean, I made a mistake. Even me modeling that has allowed my students to say, if he's doing that, because we've all had that math teacher. They did the math problem wrong. And then the student said, uh, that's wrong. I got you. I was just trying to test y'all. Like, you know, I, I couldn't be wrong. That's, that's not real. And when you're authentic and the kids know that you're human and you humanize yourself, then the kids will let their veil down and be a lot more vulnerable and be willing to make mistakes because we all know we're going to make them in learning music. Mm -hmm. But we're so afraid in this performance anxiety to make those mistakes because we have to be perfect. But we know we have to go through that struggle to get to that level of, of musicianship. So in this aspect, what I'm hearing a lot of is how can we remove these barriers? And we think of barriers, I think of simply even first step. Do they have access to your music class? Does their schedule even allow it? Is there transportation issues? Is parental influence saying, no, there's no money in that. Go do something else. Or it costs money, mm -mm, go do something else. You know? And so for us, and one thing that I pride myself off is that all of our ensembles at every school that we've worked at mirror the student population. And I'm intentional about that. When I got to Eisenhower, I said, where are my black students? I said, this is a band full of Latinos. And they looked at me like, what'd you say? I said, where are my black students, man? We got to serve our black students. They need to understand that there's a space here for them. And we were intentional about that. We went to go seek and recruit them and, and it became more reflective of the student population. But it also came in where I could remove those barriers. It was, well, I don't have room in my schedule. Cool, come after school. Well, I didn't have band in middle school. No big deal. Just do beginning band in ninth grade. We'll teach you from scratch. So will I join the band next year, like over the football games? No, you're there right now. Cool, pick up a horn, go get fitted for a uniform. Just don't play your instrument. I'll teach you along the way. And then the ones that are self-starters are going to the section leader doing already private lessons on their own. So by the time I give them proper instruction in a classroom setting, a lot of the students that I've started as beginners their freshman year have ended up in the top ensemble by their second year. And this, so this, that's unorthodox, right? You're supposed to start at a certain grade level. That's the entry point. I can't have, have eighth grade beginners. How am I gonna have an advanced band? How can I, all these conversations that we know either we've heard or even have said ourselves, we can remove those barriers because we want longevity in our career and our profession. And that has allowed me to see, this is not how we usually do it, but cool, come on. Right. We're gonna figure this out together. So here's what I'm, some things that we could do. Is financial aspect an issue? Can we create a payment plan? Is there something where I did is that pretty much anything that I charged, it was a tangible item that was going to them. It wasn't a miscellaneous band fee that I would apply to clinicians. If I'm gonna get clinicians or something of that nature, I'm gonna fundraise or ask for sponsorships on that. I'm not gonna impose it on my students because I already know there's a financial hardship. 
So even then, I don't out them for having financial hardships because sometimes this unwillingness to share. I'm broke and I'm struggling and that's okay too. So on the bottom of our fee sheet, I just put a checkbox. I need a payment plan. And then I follow up with those parents. And then I send out another email saying, or letter or whatever the case may be and saying, here are our payment plan dates. If you can make partial payments, please do so. At the end of the year, if they didn't fully pay, no big deal. We never denied them access to music because of that. This is the, the part that we changed the game with this. When we took over these programs and had 55 kids, the middle schools weren't feeding us. So we couldn't go and start chastising our middle school director for not having enough students to send to the high school. It was, hey, how can we support you? But in our aspect, we're gonna open up a beginning band over here too. And every year we had at least 40 to 50 beginners. And it was just a revolving circle and we made them part of the family immediately. This is the part that you're gonna have to be, again, can't blanket statement all of our students. My lower income students need X. No, they're gonna be situational. One's gonna need more than the other. One's gonna need something else than the other. If you're asking them, hey, I need you in all black for a concert tonight. You have to make sure they even have access to that clothing. Do you need help with that? You know, can I get, you know, can we talk to the counselor? Can we, can we organize something? And even then I, and, and, all, and all to say this, because I come from a lower income setting, I'll make it lighthearted. It won't be a tough conversation. Cause I'll say, hey, I was over here suited and booted in, in Ralph Lauren and Polo, but nobody knew it was from the thrift store. And everybody thought I had money, but man, that was a $50, 50 cent shirt. Nobody didn't have to know that. And so I tell them, I say, so if you've never been at a thrift store, there's some nice stuff there. Get some long sleeve shirts and knock it out. You don't have to show up and say, I got it at the thrift store. <laughs> you know, and see how we're joking it? But that the kids are like, oh, okay. And I can tell the kids will come back and be like, hey, you weren't lying, but you remember that thrift store down the street got some good stuff. And I was like, I told you, you know? And that, that little bit of aspect of just, let's create some solutions to a problem you have. This is life. This is how we deal with things. Transportation is a big one. I can't stay up school. I can't make it to that X, Y, and Z. My mom has to pick me up when she picks up my sibling, so I gotta go with them. You, we've all heard it. Now it's our job to teach our students to create solutions for themselves, but it's also, if we want them there, we might have to guide them to that solution quicker than, than they can. Hey, I have this band parent that's willing to, to carpool some students. Would your mom or dad be willing to speak to them, to get to know them, create that connection with y'all, so that way you know a face to a name and you can trust them. Now, if, you, if your mom wants to throw $5 a week to them for gas money, you're not gonna arrange that, but she's already been with, more than willing and she'll take you home. Really? No, I don't know if my mom will go for that. Just try. Nine times out of 10, it worked. And when it ended up happening, my band parents started getting closer and helping each other out. They realized, hey, so-and-so kid has an issue. They don't have access to this close. Let's help each other out. Da -da -da -da. And it rarely came to me at that point. Sometimes they would just inform me. I just want to give you a heads up. We went and bought so and so some some money, some some food, some, uh, some food and some clothes, because uh, they were letting us know that it's pretty hard right now. I said, thank you for doing that. So they realized I have somebody taking care of me. I feel safe. Now I'm willing to give more, and that's the music aspect of, of what we do. I love this guy. If you've never heard of Delton Brown out of Desoto High School in, in in the Texas area, that's my dude right there. And right now he's preparing four grade fives and one grade four. Uh, to go to the HBCU Consortium. So shout out Delta, because he told me this at TV. I looked at him like he was crazy. I said, you doing what? <laughs> you know, he's like, hey bro, I'm rehearsing Monday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays from four to eight. Come through if you want to come. I, was, I, I looked at him like, you doing what? <laughs> he said, you know how I got to get it, man? I'm not going to deny these kids what they deserve. And when I said, man, and when we asked him, I said, How your, how's your private lesson program? He said, private lessons? I am the private lessons. And, I, and he really is. Yeah. He is top notch. He's a product of Philip Geiger uh, back at when he was at Westfield in spring ISD when they went to BOA Grand Nets and uh, a black dude from Acres Homes, Texas that ended up moving to spring that got to benefit from Philip Geiger. And when you hear folks like this, all I can think about is like, we're optimists. We go to these sessions and we hear our colleagues say, I have a private lessons program. I have the Houston Symphony come through and da 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 da. And we're looking at him like, what, man? <laughs> Easily we can say, that doesn't apply to me. But instead we're thinking, okay, maybe each kid can't, apply, can't afford private lessons, but maybe I can do master classes and bring the kids in. Because then they're still getting exposure to a high quality musician and hearing things that are supposed to be respected to their instrument. And whether it's fundraising or each kid puts in a dollar or whatever the case may be, but you create solutions to that. So 
in removing those barriers, we really want to hone in on this idea of making deposits. Eric talked about the emotional bank that we're pouring into, but I think we have to get to the nuts and bolts of it, right? It, it sounds amazing. It's what we all want to happen in our classrooms, but the specifics of it is what's going to make that deposit be something of substance or if it's going to fade away, right? And so I think, number one, we have to take responsibility to do that. One of the things we all learn undergrad and grad and just doing the work is that you learn, you need to know the specifics of what's in your bank. What is the clarinet, the bass, all of those things, right? Because it helps with making whatever music you're trying to make. And I think if you don't take responsibility, if you leave it up to chance to make these deposits, then it'll be what it's going to be. Instead of making a, a, a conscious effort to say, okay, I know every student in each band, I know what buttons to push here, I know what buttons not to push, um, and understanding like when those kids walk in, how am I reading them and thinking, okay, they're moving really slow today. They, they don't have that same spunk. Hey, what's going on? How you doing? You good? I, I mean, for me, it's the I, I like to use the idea of family. That's just my big illustration for what I do. So even at my high school now, I've been there three years now, and so the kids I started that were in eighth grade are now sophomores. And so I got a kid named Justin, really growing into his percussion plan and responsibility. And so he comes in, and if his head is hung low with his hood on, there's something wrong and I got to pull them aside. But if I don't take that initiative, if I don't know that that's a responsibility that I have as a teacher, that as I sit there and plan out lessons and think about, okay, score study we got here in this music, okay, I need to start projecting here. If I don't think about, okay, I need to say this to this student, I need to be mindful of this, then I'm being, I'm being irresponsible with what's happening in that room. And I'm not making real authentic deposits. I don't want to make it to be something where I'm just kind of checking a list. I really want this to be authentic where when Justin comes in now, when he walks into the orchestra room and we setting up keyboards to start warm up and all of that, it's a pound every day. It's literally first thing he finds me in my office, hey Mr. McQueen, we good. <laughs> Set up his normal Mr. McQueen. Yes sir, let's get to it. Now if he's strolling in slowly, you good? I was up all night. I'm stressed. And so in that moment, I'm affecting the environment right away. So if, I, if I'm taking that responsibility, I know that the environment that I'm setting in my room, the culture that I'm building in my program really falls on me, right? We love to say, I wanna have a high, competent, comprehensive program and we need to be performing at a cutting edge level, but we don't understand that that same uh, mantra and energy needs to be pushed towards pouring into these kids. For me, I think that my goal is as I'm affecting this environment, I tell my kids, I said, ultimately, I'm your bridge. That's what I'm, that's what we're all, we're building bridges, right? I'm your bridge. And they were like, well, Mr. McLean, I don't, I'm not going to do music after high school. I may do marching band or I may, I was like, you missed it. I'm not your bridge to be me. I'm your bridge to get to wherever you're supposed to go. And so if that's an OBGYN, if that's an engineer, if that's an entrepreneur, if that's whatever, I'm that bridge. So I'm going to have to push you. I'm going to have to help you see that what we're building here, the music you're learning, is really helping you become that competent level, productive adult. And so when they know that, then they're more apt to go and do whatever I want them to do. Because in those moments in rehearsal where we're making real life contextual you know, comparisons, I'm pulling, I'm, I know what you want to be. So you coming in late on the downbeat of four, you want to be OBGYN, this person coming in delivering the baby, you late. How, how's this going to work out? Oh, Mrs. McLean, no, man, I'm not going to be. No, you late on the beat of four, you're going to be late to deliver a baby. I said, if, if my daughter walks into the hospital and she's about to have a baby and you on the roll, I'll be like, hey, we got to do something different. <laughs> right? And, and, and so it's, it's them knowing like, oh, man, he, he's not just concerned about the here and now. He's concerned about the much later. Right? And so in building that bridge, Attitude reflects leadership. One of the greatest joys that I can remember about the early years of my career. Uh, when I was at Hamilton, Eric had moved on and he was working at high school. So I took over the director of bands there. And so every morning, and I was I was working, man. Every morning, I got a sectional from this time to this time. And I would allow beginners to come in and work on what we were working on in our uh, beginner classes. Well, my seventh graders and my eighth graders would be putting up their instruments or they would be practicing whatever piece we're working through. And they would hear a kid working through some of the material that they had just went through in beginner band. And they would sit next to him and be like, oh, remember you have to clap and count that 
Okay, your finger. And I'm walking in the bed. I'm, you know how we are. We're making copies and stop not trying to see administrators because they want us to cover this class and all this kind of stuff. So I walk in the band hall. I'm like, hey, what, what y'all, what are y'all doing? Hey, 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 let them practice. Don't come. No, Mr. McLean, I'm trying to help them. They're, they're having trouble with the downbeats. They're not holding notes past one. So I'm, and so I just stood, sat, sat back and stood in my, sat at my desk and I said, this is why you pour into kids. Because at the end of the day, we're developing adults that are either going to model quality things or they're going to do negative. Right. And so that other side of discomfort is where I found growth and making these deposits. Because there were days where I didn't want to engage the kids in that manner. Just to be honest, like if, we, if we're going to talk today, right? Like it's days you walk in the band hall, I'm here to teach. We don't have rehearsals today, so I'm leaving. But I, I grew in moments because I said, oh, this is what the kid feels like. Oh, this, this is how they feel. And, and I'm an adult enough to know I'm making a check, I got this, I got that. But this 12-year-old doesn't know how to compartmentalize. And so then I had to say, I, gotta, I have to make a deposit to help them understand how to pull themselves from those places. Not to be perfect, not to say that their day is going to get, it, it could get progressively worse. But how do I just focus in right now and allow this moment to help me grow and understand resiliency, help me understand growth, and just like being locked in for that moment. So hopefully the sound works. I'm gonna leave you with this. These are two of our students. Um, Chewy right here, just March Cadets. Uh, he's one of our tuba music education majors at, at Prairie View A&M right now. Uh, and the second student is doing extremely well, uh, but they both attended Heights High School where we last taught at. I wanna share just a little bit about what they're going through right now. All right. I wasn't in band, I don't think I would have uh went to college to do whatever I wanted to because I didn't know what I wanted to do. So when I when I got into band, I, I, I kind of started to like it. And I was like, what do, you wanna, what do I want to do as a career? And so I, I, I started thinking about music. And I wasn't really sure about it until like junior or senior year. And I'm like, where can I go and where, where can I study music? And so because of band, I'm here at PV. And yeah, that's what I'm doing. My name is Mira Ramirez. I play the flute. I'm a junior and this is my why. Band is the only consistent thing in my life. It adds a sense of normality where I know I have something to look forward to at the end of the day or in the morning. It's something where I can come to and look forward to it because I know it's going to be there when I need it. When everything outside of the band hall is going crazy and I feel like I can't catch my breath or I can't just catch myself, I know I have 150 people in here to, for, to look out for me. I have 150 people in here to cry to, to talk to, to just vent to. And I think having that sense of safety and normality, it helped, it helped me get through my past two years here at Heights High School. I lost my uncle, um, my parents got divorced. I went to CPS custody and through all that, I still had somewhere to come to and that somewhere was the band hall. And that area where I know I could be safe and I could talk to anyone I needed to. Ladies and gentlemen, we can't thank you enough for allowing us to even just be here in your presence. Um, we can't thank Brett enough because I know he's the one that kind of pulled us over here. And uh, we we are elated just to be able to break bread with y'all last night uh, and, and just meet y'all and then be able to get the opportunity to sit in front of y'all and present today.